to try to share with you and try to convince you about a slightly new way of thinking about liberty. It's a new way, people think it's a new way, it's actually, I, I believe, a very old way, but it's a way that some of us are being called bleeding heart libertarians have been trying to work out. So I'm going to share some of that with you. And what I want to tell you about is the current state of debate among philosophers, philosophers who think about democracy, who think about freedom in different, in different ways, and the way there's an analogy between the divide between philosophers, the stark divide among philosophers, and a stark divide within many of our polities. That is, there's a, there's a disagreement among philosophers that's reflected in disagreements in, 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 in the politics of real societies. And anyone who's a philosopher on the freedom side faces a similar situation to people who are change, change agents on the social side. That is, how to cross this divide between these two camps. And the way I think about the, the divide between the two camps among the philosophers, in my own head, and in the book Free Market Fairness, I talk about this um, sort of metaphor that's in my mind. The way I think of the divide in the, among the philosophers is like a frozen, windswept sea. And it's ice across the top, and there's a cold, stiff wind blowing across that sea, little tufts of snow going across. And off one coast, off the, right, off the right coast, is the camp, the embattled camp, of the liberals, or as we Americans say, the libertarians. It's, uh, they're hunkered down on the ice, in tents, with the wind blowing pretty hard against them. It's kind of an embattled camp in the academy, a very embattled camp uh, within the academy. Um, I picture them there with the wind blowing. It's cold, it's kind of miserable, but they kind of like it. If you're an embattled academic minority, there's a certain frisson of be about being in that position. They also, though the winds blow and they're very cold and the sides of the tent are flapping pretty hard, they're pretty confident about their, tack, about their tent because they know that the tent is held down on the ice with these stakes that are pounded deep into the ice, stakes provided them by people like John Locke long ago. And though the winds may howl around them, they know that those tents are going nowhere. Across the windswept divide, on the other side, is a more luxurious camp. It's the camp of the people on the left, the academics on the left. This is the academically dominant camp. We can call them socialists or social democrats, or they sometimes call themselves, again, in the American context, new liberals or modern liberals. And in that camp, I picture them not in tents, but rather in igloos, igloos blocked together by people like Karl Marx, and more recently by John Rawls. And it's much more comfortable in it to be in an igloo than it is to be in a cold tent. And I imagine them in their igloos as having um, uh, space heaters and television, television discs. They can watch lots of lefty public television programs. And they have furs. Faux furs, of course, this is the left camp. And in that camp, they talk about social justice. That's their battle cry. And, they, and, they're, very, and they're very optimistic about big government and the, and the capacity of government agencies to deliver social justice for all the people. But in that camp, though, they're very skeptical of economic liberty. And the idea of economic liberty in particular is something that they rarely talk about, or if they accept it, they accept it only very reluctantly. The tent people, our people, on the other hand, and their camp, they talk about economic liberty and private property. But in that camp, the traditional camp of the libertarians or the liberals, the phrase social justice is only rarely or dismissively heard. That divide is mirrored in these philosophical concepts. So here's one way to look at it. Um, I divide schools, so the schools are liberalism on the right, let's say, and something like social democracy on the left. The politics, the political system each recommends. Liberals advocate limited government, mainly because when liberals think about social construction, when they think about making the world a better place, when they think about human activity in pursuit of aims and goals, liberals tend to emphasize spontaneous processes, spontaneous order. By contrast, the Social Democrats care about a different idea, or at least they claim to care about a different idea, social justice. Here's the point I want to get, show you, though. This debate, these familiar debates between the advocates of liberty 
and the advocates of equality or social justice between the liberals and the social democrats, those political debates are actually rooted in a philosophical debate, a philosophical debate way over here about moral personality. And the interesting thing is that the sharpness of the divide between these two camps, the thing that freezes over the ice and makes the wind blow so they can't communicate across the divide, is because way in the back behind these political debates, there's a philosophical debate about how we do politics at all, how we think about society at all. And when you understand why this philosophical debate, when you understand the structure of the philosophical debate, I think it can help you to understand why people have trouble hearing one another and perhaps sometimes hearing the message that you're trying to bring them. So for example, you can do this, lo you can do this lots of different ways. I'm just going to do it in one simplified way that I like. For liberals, when they think about politics, most people when they think about politics, most philosophers, begin with an idea of what the person is like. They begin with an idea with, we begin with what an idea of what the person is like because politics is about the question, how should people live together? And if you want to know how people should live together, how they should interact, you need to know what a person is. And liberals, following, let's say, the work of John Locke, tend to reason in very individualistic ways, and they start with the idea of a person as a self-owner. John Locke, as most of you know, thought about, thought we should think about politics by asking about the state of nature, asking what we're like in the state of nature before there's politics at all. And Locke said, if you think, consider us before the state, what we really are, each of us, is someone who owns themselves. Own ourselves, we own our labor too. If we own our labor, we can mix our labor with unknown things out there in the material world and come to take possession of those things. And on Locke's view, as most of you probably know, Locke, Locke thought there was this God-designed God fit between the way we were made, created, and the way the world was created. So for example, um, I'm a being, we're all beings that have mouths, and we have stomachs, and our stomachs get hungry, and they growl. Out there in the world, there are things created by God like trees with apples on them. If I pick an apple and take possession of that and eat it, it goes to my stomach and I'm satisfied. For Locke, property seems to be built into the very fabric of the universe. And there's a very powerful line many of you probably are familiar with from a liberal perspective, that these natural rights are just part of the way the world is and that property is among the most important natural rights. So for Locke, and people reasoning in this way, Nozick, others, when they think about self-ownership and they reason in individualistic ways about what it means to respect people, when it comes time to ask about what politics should be, what the state should be like, the state should reflect and respect people the way they are to assumed to be. And if people are self-owners, and if property rights are part of our natural, natural rights that we have in the state of nature, then one of the things the state should do, maybe the most important thing the state should do, is protect property rights. So from that idea of a person, starting there, the idea of a self-owner, you derive this idea that government should be limited, that it should protect liberty, and especially the economic liberty. And that's the liberal view. Interestingly and importantly, many people start in a, different, in a different place. Many of the people who you're trying to convince or to move to another way of thinking, people you're hoping to, to whom you're hoping to show the value of liberty, often begin with a very different idea, not just about politics, but they begin with a different idea about moral personality. They start off with the idea of the good citizen. And people like Rousseau said that a citizen is a being that has two moral powers, two ways of seeing the world. First, a citizen can see that he or she has a life to lead, and that life is really important to him. After all, it's our life. So each of us have a, has a life in front of us. It's our life, and it's incredibly important because it is our life. But they also say, these people, that the citizen has a, has a second power. Along with seeing the importance of my own life, each of us also has the capacity as citizens to see the importance of each of our fellow citizens' lives. Notice that you can take that idea of the, of the good citizen and immediately run it in a slavery direction. 
where since you, have to, since you have to see the importance of your fellow citizens' lives, you should sacrifice your life to them. But it needn't go that way. If you think of yourself as having a life that's important, but also seeing the importance of your fellow citizens' lives, you don't give up the idea that your life is important, and politics should reflect that. But on this tradition, then, seeing that twin capacities of citizens, and trying to figure out, no, how do we figure out what the state should be like, they don't think about the state of nature so much as they argue in a more communitarian way. They ask what obligations people have to one another as citizens, what rights they have, but also what obligations they have. And they reason, they try to, they, they engage in a process of public reasoning rather than natural rights to figure out what the state should be like. And one of the central findings that people who reason this way come up with is the idea that in a just society, no one should be left behind. If everyone's life matters, then everyone's life matters equally. And that means that in a just society, a just society should be acceptable to all the citizens who are going to live within them, the richest ones and the poorest ones too. That is, they accept something like social justice. So that's kind of a quick, that's kind of a quick um, account of where philosophy is, or at least where philosophy has been for some time. And you can see the important point is that this divide out here, when people confront each other in the political realm, they just talk past each other. Part of the reason is that they start from very different premises, and they see the world individualistically or perhaps communitarianly, if that's a word. They start with a self-owner, or they start with a good citizen. And it's because they have these different philosophical premises that they end up having these different worldviews about politics. And so for a long time, among philosophers, but also in our practical politics, we've, in, we've been living in these dichotomies, free markets or fairness, limited government or big government, John, John Locke or Rousseau, one side or the other, everybody has to choose. Well, I don't like that. I haven't liked it for a long time. When I was a graduate student um, at Oxford, I remember thinking to myself, when I was starting to see this map, I was so excited to go talk to the philosophers about this dispute. I thought, well, I'll talk to some of these really smart philosophers, and we'll actually figure out which is the morally best way to think about moral personality. But what I found out was, in fact, that we all knew that whoever won this debate was going to win this debate. And almost all my professors were lefties. So every time we had a serious discussion here, we always knew that the discussion was, the discussion was always infected by the awareness that whoever won this one was going to win this one. And people care about this as much as they care about this, so you really can go nowhere with it. But I'm part of a group of people who are trying to, try, try, try to do something new. In some ways, it's new and controversial. That's why Andrew was encouraging you to not be deceived by my smile and ask me hard questions when I'm through. But I actually think that what we're trying to do is really old. Um, one of the most attractive features of, liber of, of the liberal idea, at least since Adam Smith, has been the distinctive concern that liberals have shown for the poor. In his day, Adam Smith was criticized by, Robert, by, by Malthus for caring too much about the poor. It was a, 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 an integral part of the defense of liberty was that it was a concern for all people, including the working poor. And what we're trying to do, some of us, is to see whether there's a new way to think about these things, a new, or, or, or perhaps a new way to revive an old way, where we put front and center for people who care about liberty, a kind of liberalism which focuses on the poor. We don't give up our concern for, for economic freedom. On the contrary, we think we can put a stronger defense for economic freedom than some of the old defenses. We want to combine a concern for economic freedom with a concern for social justice. And the way I do it, there's lots of different ways it can be done, and a lot of us are on the blog that Andrew mentioned are trying to find our own ways. My way of doing it is that I start as a tent person, like many of you I suppose are, with a very strong commitment to liberty, and especially to economic liberty, private property rights. And what I do though is I leave my camp behind. So one chilly morning, I crawled out of the tent I got tired of trying to call across that windswept divide with the wind drowning my voice 
and finding myself unable to move people to my side, I crawled out of the can of my tent and I took some, I, 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 I built myself a little icebreaker and I climbed aboard my icebreaker, but I brought with me some intuitions, some intuitions from the liberal side about the importance of economic liberty. Then I chugged across the frozen wood swept divide, chug, 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 and I joined the people who start from this premise. And what I tried to do as I approached the camp of the people with the, the igloos was to accelerate a little bit with my icebreaker and crash into the full ice floe that they're on really hard, but gently and in a friendly way since we're all great friends now. And I try to bust up the ice beneath their feet because these people claim and have historically claimed to be sincerely committed to the idea that we, have to, we should care about all our fellow citizens. And if you, if you, one of the things that's been striking about them, though, is that they all have shared a bias. All these people deliberating together about what it means to respect one another have shared some biases against economic liberty. And my thought is, well, what if we use their same technique that they claim to be use, have used all these years, but now remove the bias and maybe try to open up the debate now? So we look down at the premises beneath our feet and ask ourselves some new questions together in a deliberative if you like, communitarian way. For example, among the questions I ask are, is deliberative democracy, or is democracy, really a vehicle that can only make left turns? Kind of weird, right? Just the idea that we're going to deliberate about how to respect one another automatically required if you go for a big state? Why is that? Why, isn't there, why, isn't there a communi why couldn't there be a communitarian ideal where we say we care about liberty and we respect our fellow citizens precisely by respecting their liberty. Isn't there a form of community in which people, is, people look at one another and say, I will not use the state to coerce you. That's how I show you that I respect you. Isn't it possible to ask questions with economic liberty such as this, do we really best respect our fellow citizens in this supposedly communitarian perspective by seeking to use the state to limit their economic liberty? to tie them up with red tape and green tape? Is that really the best way to respect our fellow citizens? And my idea is that you can, if you reason this way, starting with their, from their own premises, but get rid of the biases that they've had against economic liberty, what you find is that you, a real commitment to care about one another and to respect one another as authors of, of our own lives, you get something like a strong commitment to private liberty but also commitment to the idea that in a decent and just society, no one who wants to be a participant should be left behind. If people are willing to work and want to work, they should have a real chance, a real chance to make something of their lives. And we advocate limited government and spontaneous order as an engine towards that idea of social justice, and people call us bleeding heart libertarians. When I, when I actually was working this myself, I tried to call this, I called myself a neoclassical liberal. But about around the time I came up with that really ugly phrase, my friend Matt Solinsky started the blog Bleeding Heart Libertarians. He started marketing t-shirts and coffee mugs with a heart on it and so on. So that name's taken over, so I'm, I'll adopt that name now. Okay, so how do you get that? Well, so that's the, that's the strategy, that's, that's the idea. And I wanna show you how I'm gonna make it work. So I give you, again, some more philosophical pieces and um, to make this work, to get a, a, a coherent theory of bleeding heart libertarianism, you need two things. First, you need an argument for economic liberty that's based on democracy or the idea of citizenship. So you can't cheat anymore. You can't say, look, I'm gonna advocate economic liberty because of self-ownership. If you're gonna come down here and play with these people, you have to genuinely play on their terms. As much as I have been attracted to this for a long time, I think this is a more morally attractive way to start thinking about politics. But as I said, you need two things to go this way. You need a democratic argument for economic liberty. Then you also need an account of social justice that's compatible with economic liberty. Anytime we recognize a liberty, the rights that people have in some domain, we limit the power of the state. We say the bullies can't come in this domain and do things to us. But historically, when people advocate social justice, 
What they advocate is bullies coming in and making people do stuff. They advocate coercion. So the question, the challenge for the view is, well, if we're going to have some very strong private economic liberties, and thus they'll be liberals, how can you get an account of social justice that's compatible with that? So I'm going to say a word or two about both of those challenges. So this is how I do it. And again, there's many ways it can be done, but this is my way. I'm interested in the idea of justice as fairness. And here's a formulation of justice as fairness that, you might, that I find attractive. We should regard as the most desired order of society the one we would choose if we knew that our initial position in it would be determined purely by chance, such as the fact of our being born into a particular family. It's worth pausing to see the power, I think, of that idea of fairness. The idea is that if we're trying to decide what whole social system would be a good one for us to live, with, live in, would actually respect us and allow us to respect one another as authors of our own lives, and respect everybody, not just some, but everybody in the whole society, that we should imagine ourselves choosing different social forms behind a kind of a veil that makes us ignorant about who in particular we're going to be. So if we're examining a socialist society, or an aristocratic society, or a free society, we're not allowed to know whether we're going to turn out to be a rich person or a poor person in that society. Whether we're going to be a really smart person in that society or a really, I don't know, dumb person in that society. Whether we're going to be black or white or Asian or whatever it might be. Whether we're going to be a male or a female. If you put that veil of ignorance in front of us, the society that we would choose would be the one that would reflect our idea that we could be anyone at all. And that's, re that's how we respect everyone. I'm just curious, I don't know how many of you do philosophy, but does anyone know who hasn't read my book um, who this quotation is from? Yeah, so it looks a lot like John Rawls. This guy, John Rawls, in 1971, wrote a book called A Theory of Justice, where he developed this idea of justice as fairness. He described a position that he called the original position, where people reason behind a veil of ignorance. This is actually, though, not from John Rawls. This is from John Rawls' great rival, Frederick Hayek. And I came up with this idea um, in, 19, in 1940, 30 years before Rawls. And Hayek gets, tells the story that when he was in London as a, a young economist, I think he was maybe in his late 30s, maybe he was 40, I'm not sure. Um, the, he was there, there during the bombing. And the bombing was getting worse and worse, and he thought he might die. And he had young children. So he started thinking about where he could send his kids around the, around the world. He started getting letters from friends in different countries. And Hayek says that this practical question, when he had to think to himself, where should he send his kids, got him thinking about the philosophical issue. What's the right way to think about a just society? Because if he were killed, his kids, his kids could wind up being anywhere, anyone at all in the society. They wouldn't have the benefits of a, famous, a world famous economist as a father, though Hayek in 1940 had no reason to think he might become a Nobel Prize winning famous economist, <laughs> nonetheless, he knew that his kids could be anyone at all. And that got him thinking in these ways. And he considered offers, by the way, from Argentina and Sweden and the US. And in a fascinating footnote in Law, in law Legislation and Liberty, he says that he chose the United States using this test. Interestingly, again, this is 1940, Hayek says that he chose the US because he knew one thing about his kids that, they, they, that, was, that was certain. He knew that his kids were white, not black. And he says if, his, if he didn't know if his kids would be white or black, he wouldn't have chosen the United States because of the racial injustice in America in 1940. I mention that not just to say Hayek's a cool guy about race, though I think he was, but rather more important to show how deeply Hayek was into this whole, what we now think of as a Rawlsian idea. So Hayek was really buying into the idea that there was this, there was this process independent test for a just society. And he thinks that this is something like it. And I'll just mention, by the way, that Rawls, writing 30 years later, called his version of this the original position. But if Hayek came up with it 30 years earlier, Hayek has got to be the original, the original position, which rendered Rawls' position the unoriginal position. So if you take anything away from this, take away Rawls and the unoriginal position. Well, so what do we do? So if we reason this way, what do we get? So first, you're going to get two things out of, out of, this, kind of, a, out of this, kind of a this kind of a method, this kind of an approach. So you get two things. First, you get a list of basic rights and liberties. And one of the really striking things is that 
Um, when you think about the rights and liberties that people have, so we want to have some protections for ourselves. So we have to ask ourselves, if we're not going to know who we're going to be, we want to have some domains of our, activi- of our lives that are going to be protected. So we might be very religious, we might not be very religious. We might be um, someone who has all kinds of intellectual ideas, we might not be a person that way. But we're going to have some rights, we're going to want to pick up some rights that they are going to defend us, no matter what our plan of life might be. Interestingly, starting around 1850, or so before 1850, most liberals agreed that property rights were among the most important rights. But starting in 1850, a sort of division started happening within liberalism. I trace it back to Mill primarily around the middle of the 1800s. And Mill said that, they're all in this wonderful book on liberty, he talks about this stirring defense of freedom. But interestingly, Mill says that the domain of economic activity, saving, choosing a career, working, making these choices in the economic domain, for Mill, those were, actually, were not expressions of liberty. He didn't recognize liberty interests that people have in their economic lives. He thought economic stuff is stuff we just do to get materials to lead the life of the intellectual like he was. He didn't see those workaday activities that are so much an important part of ordinary working class people as being a domain of freedom too. So too, following in Mill's footsteps, John Maynard Keynes writing in 19. 30, I um, wrote a book, an essay called Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren. Some of you, don't any, any of you know that essay? You should read it. If, whatever you think of Keynes' economics, he's a brilliant writer and there's a short essay called, you can get it online, Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren by John Maynard Keynes. It is the single best window into the mind of the left that I've ever, found, ever seen. And in that essay, briefly, Keynes says that, look, things are really bad right now, 1930. He says, within 100 years, we're going to have grown by about 10 times. And crucially, Keynes says, when that happens, we will have grown enough. 20, 30, say right, right now even. And at that point, Keynes says, the economic problem will have been solved. It's done now. No more need for that kind of activities. At that point, the bourgeois virtues, saving, spending, planning, aspiring for your children to have more than you have, all those workaday things that working people care so much about, Those bourgeois virtues, he says, will be recognized for being the vices that they always were. So Lord Keynes, looking down his long nose from from Cambridge at these workaday activities, said these are not really virtues at all. They're just things we needed for a while to get, till the day of abundance arrived, then we can put them aside. And he says further, people who keep on working and saving and striving in the economic realm, once the day of abundance has arrived, are suffering from morbid neuroses and he even suggests that they should be consigned to mental institutions. So too, seriously, and he says worse things about the Jews. So too, uh, John Rawls, another aristocrat of a sort, writing in 1971, when he, get, when he uses his little device, comes up with this list of basic rights and liberties, economic liberties get shrunk down to nothing. And so we get that divide within liberalism between people who think economic liberties are part of liberty, not just because they're important for growth, or economic reasons, or political reasons, but for, as part of the good life, the part of the decent respect we owe one another is to respect our chance and our, to, to make something of ourselves. And so that's, that's that left liberal line. In my book, Free Market Fairness, I talk about a different approach to that idea. And I got my approach to economic liberty mainly from reading feminist literature, especially 19th century feminists. And one of the things that 19th century feminists said that really struck me was that no matter how gently the paternalist male treats the, the, the female, no matter how lovely the, gla- the glass house or the gilded cage that the woman's kept in, no matter how, how often the water is changed in the cage, and no matter how tasty the seeds are that are put in there for her to peck at, no matter how nice the swing is that she's allowed to swing on, no matter how lovely and, and well tended to a woman might be in a patriarchal relationship, If the woman's rights are denied, and especially if her rights to have economic freedoms, to in some sense have a chance to be a cause of there being a cage, of there being fresh water, of there being good seeds, if she's denied the chance to be in some sense a contributor to that state of affairs, then no matter how pleasant that cage might look, it's still fundamentally a cage. And she's been disrespected no matter how pampered she may be. And my thought is that that idea, that feminist idea, 
women who saw so clearly that having good stuff is not as important as being involved in creating those things, that that feminist idea can be taken and turned and trained against the ideal of the social democracies. That it's not clear that we best respect people or that parties who talk about the big state providing things to people, it's not clear that those parties are actually the parties that really respect people. That it can look like respect, just like patriarchy looks like, like respect. But in fact, there's a higher ideal, a liberal ideal, which recognizes the freedom of people to be causes of their own lives. The feminists saw that clearly. I think we can look at that also. The second thing I'll just say more briefly, because I think I'm probably pushing this to the middle <laughs> So as I said, you want to reason out first what rights people have. And I think when you reason this way, and you put yourself aside, you recognize those biases from Mill and Keynes and Rawls. You might even do some sociology as to why they have these aristocratic views. And you see the importance, using feminist insights, to see the importance of economic liberty. You recognize, in fact, that there's a, there's a very strong democratic case for very powerful rights of working and owning that individual people have. What about the second part, social justice? More briefly. You know, we didn't really know what social justice was. We didn't have a clear sense for what it might mean until fairly recently. And I'll just show you, I just want to give you one, one idea that I think might be useful to you. There are sort of two, idea, two ways of thinking about social justice. And one of them is, is very popular, but it's completely wrong. And it's easy to show why it's wrong, like in two seconds flat. Some people think that social justice is a matter, about, is, is a matter of equality. So they think that if you want to have a just society, a socially just society, it should be an equal society. That means that the more equal a society is, the more just it is. So if you have one set of social institutions that produce a distribution that's kind of like this, let's say there's a big government moving money around, though those tend to get inequalities, as we all know. But let's say, imagine they can actually do it and get an equal society. Another society with lots of inequality, which society is better? Well, if you think equality matters, you're going to say this society is better. But notice, when people talk about equality mattering, they don't actually mean that what they say. They talk about equality as a kind of a proxy for caring about the poor. Because after all, imagine this equal society now being very equal. Let's make it even more equal, really equal. But now put, it way, put the income level way down here on the ground. You probably can't see me, but on the ground. So people have incredible equality right down here on the carpet. They're poverty stricken, but they're all equal. Now, this, that's an incredibly equal society. If you care about equality, and you think justice is a matter about equality, so that the more equal the society is, the more just it is, you have to say that's a just society. But nobody thinks that. It's a crazy view. That must mean that, in fact, we don't care about equality. We care about something else. Something like, how do the poor do? How do the least well-off workers do over time? And one of the striking ideas from some recent left liberal thinking, and it can be adopted by people on the right, is that a society that aims at economic growth, a society that respects economic liberty, that is committed to respecting the entrepreneurial aspects within ourselves, the aspirations to support oneself, to be a responsible citizen, to build a life and to be a cause of one's own life, societies like that aim at growth enthusiastically there's an ambivalence among the left in the academics, but also, I think, in the popular politics. It's a striking fact that John Stuart Mill, John Maynard Keynes, and John Rawls all thought that justice could be achieved in a stationary state. They all thought, as a matter of philosophical ideal, that you could have a state with no more growth, and that could be a just society. They thought that because they see a good life and a just society as being a society where people spend a lot of time deliberating about dis distributions and arguing about who gets what and redistributing things. There's an opportunity, that means, for a different conception of, of, of social justice, a liberal one or a, li a libertarian one. On that conception of social justice, we aim not at equality or the stationary state. We rather accept capitalism and we celebrate capitalism. And we advocate growth not just today or tomorrow, but for as long as people can make it happen, as long as free people can keep, keep coming up with new ideas. That society, through time, grows. It may grow more unequal, but that's not the important thing from a liberal perspective. The important thing is this. Watch my thumbs. How are the poorest people among us doing? 
Do we best respect our, respect our fellow citizens as free and equal authors of their own lives by trying to catch them into these democratic games of deliberation? Or do we best respect them by trying to set them free? By giving them strong rights, but also setting up our economy in such a way that entrepreneurs can be engines of growth so that even the least well off over time have more and more stuff. Um, bleeding heart libertarianism then is an attempt to combine uh, economic liberty with social justice. I'll just close with this slide. Briefly, this is what I think happened. This is historically. In the last century, some people on the left came up with an idea of social justice. They created this divide within liberals between left liberals and uh, libertarians. And what they did was work out all these theories of social justice that all, in fact, turned out to be just one school of social justice. So all the theories we have of social justice, you know, libertarians hate social justice. That's, we were all raised, I was raised, to think, well, if I'm a libertarian, I have to object to social justice because it means the big state. But in fact, we were sold a bill of goods. What we actually got was, all we have so far, is a whole bunch of social democratic theories of social justice. That means there's an opportunity to develop, I think it was the undiscovered country, libertarian or liberal theories of social justice. I call them market democratic. In my book, Free Market Fairness, I develop a theory of social justice that has those two components that I just mentioned. First, unlike all these theories, the market democratic one or the free market fairness one is strongly and adamantly committed to private economic liberty. It's also the committed to the idea of social justice based on the idea that growth is a good thing, that economic freedom and its products are fruits we should all enjoy. And we should not be embarrassed to be enthusiastic about capitalism, to be enthusiastic about property rights, in part because they help growth. So we're bleeding out libertarians. Um, I'm happy to take your questions, and I won't smile. <laughs>